president of the strategic foresight group and international think tank based in Mumbai. Today we are here to discuss new realities, but a particular new reality, new, new reality of the increasing strategic value of water. Last November, United Nations Security Council, for the first time in the history of the UN, convened a special session on the linkage between water, peace, and security. In February, UN Security Council passed a resolution on cooperation on terrorism. But in that resolution also, they mentioned water infrastructure is, as one of the important uh, issues uh, to be looked at. In June, Bolivia convened another session of the UN Security Council. Today, here at Blade Forum, we are discussing water, peace, and security. So what's going on? Why is there a growing debate on the linkages between water and security, or water as a strategic issue? To find answer to this question, and to see what we do with water as a strategic asset, we have an excellent panel. On my right is Danilo Turk. He is known to everybody here, former president of the Republic of Slovenia. And he is also, which I'm not sure how many of you know this, is the chairman of the global high-level panel on water and peace. On my left is Kabine Komara, former prime minister of Guinea. And he was also, until recently, the high commissioner of the Senegal River Basin Organization, which in French is abbreviated as OMVS and better known as OMVS. On his left is Ambassador P.O. Venabst, Assistant Director General of the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation. And he is quite committed to the international water cooperation uh, in his current role. On Danilo Tark's uh, right, we have Ambassador Kaira Saribaya, a senior diplomat from Kazakhstan, currently posted to Vienna, also Slovenia, I presume, including that. And uh, uh, Kazakhstan has water security as one of its uh, uh, top priorities. So he will have some things to say. And on his right is Professor Aaron Wolf, all the way from the United States, from the west coast of the United States. And he is known as the dean of the studies in water diplomacy. Uh, you are at University of Oregon, Oregon State, uh, Oregon State University, in the, in the geography school there. So we have, we have, a, we have an excellent uh, uh, panel here. And let me start with you, Danilo Turk. As I said, there is a lot of indications of the growing interest in water from a security point of view. Water as a development issue has been established. A few years ago, General Assembly also recognized water as a human rights issue. Why is this new, real, new reality of water's growing value or appreciation as a strategic issue? Uh, thank you, Sandeep. My answer will be in two parts. Uh, first, a very succinct answer to your question. And then second part, I hope we can watch a short video clip which will explain uh, the way the, the, the stage at which we are with the preparation or finalization of the report of the global high-level panel on water and peace. I guess we have technical uh, equipment prepared for, for, for that. All right, so uh, my, my short introduction to this will be really very short. Uh, I think that there are two reasons <coughs> why um, the link, the nexus between water and peace is becoming more recognized this at present. One is very sad, we see in contemporary armed conflicts a very rapid deterioration of respect for international humanitarian law. More and more often, uh, water resources and water infrastructure are being attacked, they are ob object of attack, and water is being used as a weapon of war. So that has created concern which was not there before, and that very dramatically uh, reminds us of the nexus between water and peace. Water resources should be protected and should be outside military objectives and military action. The second reason is uh, more peace-directed, and that is 
Water cooperation is increasingly recognized as an important aspect of international cooperation, one that stabilizes peace and is becoming more and more, uh, more, and more necessary. And of course, in that second area, uh, peaceful cooperation, we have a long history, but that history is partial, it's not comprehensive. We have water commission, river commissions and other types of bilateral and regional cooperative arrangements. But it is recognized that more and more is needed. The international aquifers, the underground water, for example, are shared, but very little cooperative um, arrangement exists in that regard. Uh, very few water uh, cooperation ar arrangements exist. So the feeling of a need for strengthening the peace uh, function of water cooperation is there. Now, I have to uh, explain that the Strategic Foresight Group uh, in Mumbai has done a lot of analytical work in that regard and has come with a very important hypothesis, the um, water cooperation quotient, that countries that cooperate on water issues well secure peace in a much more fundamental way. In fact, countries that have good water cooperation are unlikely to get involved in any type of armed conflict. Uh, now, that's an interesting uh, proposition. It's, uh, I think it's a caution that can be uh, proven. And of course, if that is the case, then uh, obviously uh, the global community has to pay attention and has to do something about further cooperation. And now, if we, ha if we are ready, let's, let's, let's see the video clip. <coughs> Welcome everybody. I'm inviting you to join in an important international project, in a project on water and peace. And I'm doing so from Geneva, from a city which has for centuries been a symbol of humanitarianism and international cooperation. An international cooperation we need in matters of water. In many parts of the world, water scarcity has become a dramatic problem. Water quality is deteriorating in other parts of the world. And above all, the climate change has introduced many negative consequences for quantity and quality of water worldwide. So we are facing a drama, a potential crisis of water. Does this affect international peace and security? Yes, it does. And we have seen how water has become central in contemporary armed conflicts. Water has become not only an object of attack, but also a weapon of war. And this has to be changed. This has to stop. International humanitarian law must prevail. However, the majority of tasks are in the time of peace. We have to improve international water cooperation. We have to find new forms of applying the norms of international water law. We have to do more to improve quality and appropriate quantities of water and to manage water resources more coherently. This management will largely take part at the level of national policy making. But to an ever larger extent, this will be an international project. We have to improve the international mechanisms, the mechanisms of finance that support international water cooperation and international water diplomacy. These problems have been studied by our panel on water and peace. That panel was initiated by a group of 15 co-convening countries, including Switzerland, Senegal, Costa Rica, my country, Slovenia, and others. We hope that the panel members have fulfilled the tasks, made the analysis, and proposed uh, relevant recommendations. We hope that we shall be able to generate interest and action as a result of this report. I'm inviting you to come to Geneva on 14 September this year when we are launching the report in Maison de la Paix in the city of Geneva. We hope you will all come and that you will also participate in events which will follow. Some of them will take place in New York and in other parts of the world. And we would like to generate a global movement for blue peace, for peace where water is leveraged as an important instrument of peaceful international cooperation. 
We would also like to tell you that yeah, the event on 14th September will include a musical element. Composers from Switzerland, from Central America, West Africa and Middle East have composed a symphony of water and peace. You will enjoy the music, you will be energized by music, and I'm sure that all together we shall be able to change the world, to change the level of our cooperation for water and peace, and that as a result the world be a better place for all of us to live. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Danilo, for that uh, invitation. I, I hope uh, many of you will be able to make it to Geneva on the 14th of uh, September. That's next week. But you already revealed some of the recommendations which you are going to issue. Uh, strength for new methods of water diplomacy, innovative measures for financial cooperation to promote transboundary uh, uh, water cooperation, and thirdly, overall strengthening of the transboundary water cooperation. But I won't ask you to reveal much more at this stage. Now, this invitation you are extending, but also it's being extended by the government of Switzerland, who are hosting the event. Pio, why is government of Switzerland taking so much interest in promoting water diplomacy? There are 15 countries which are co-convening countries of this global high-level panel on water and peace. But the idea was initiated by the Swiss government you have been really very active in uh, uh, t t taking this panel ahead, also uh, promoting the Blue Peace Movement. What's behind this? Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe I will start by saying that I, exactly the same question uh, was raised by, by the government of China when I was in Beijing a few months ago. I was asking, why you, the Swiss, are so, so active? Why are you interested in all these issues? What, what's your, what are you getting out of this? Um, yeah, and I, I gave an answer. I will give the same answer, um, and I will, maybe I will add one element to that answer at that time. Fir and there are three messages from, the, from Switzerland, if you want, at this stage. Of course. First of all, you know, as, as we saw, as has been discussed, the, the work of the High Level Panel on Water and Peace is, uh, is, a, is part of a long journey. It's, it's not the beginning, it's not the end. It's a very important in intermediate step, but it's really a long journey. Now, the first reason why we Switzerland, we are very much engaged from already for many years on these issue, issues is, first of all, you know that Switzerland is one of the uh, water tower of Europe, of course. Um, the second one comes from our traditions. What we learned many, 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 many years ago already is that uh, well, the only way to, to build stable societies and nations is by working on what unites us and not what by work on what divides us. And uh, water can be something very divisive, but water can be something very unifying. This is also what we learned from our own experience when we had to discuss and work on, on several rivers, uh, uh, the use of the water on several rivers flowing from Switzerland. Um, and so we, <coughs> took, we decided to, to really systematically uh, put the the issues on, on uh, shared waters uh, as something that would be part of our main, main work. So this is not something new, we, we kept on doing it. Uh, we started some activities in what we call the, now we, we are going to call the Blue Peace as a, possibly as a movement, this will be my second point. Um, but in Central Asia we've been active uh, for a long time already in uh, trying to force in a very pragmatic, uh, way dialogue that leads to a certain moment to shared views but also shared programs 
because it's fine to have sharing views and have discussions, but till you don't invest in, for instance, in, uh, in a river basin, riparian countries don't make a, 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 a shared investment plan, um, this will be just remaining at words. For the second point is, what we realized is that political will is key, but this is not sufficient. Uh, yesterday you were at the panel, I was listening at the, at the high level panels of yesterday meeting, and then a lot of discussions are taken from on security issues, for instance, from a, of course, from a national perspective. And this is how far it goes at purely political level. You need something else. You need something very concrete to work on in order to make the political support for peaceful processes to make it uh, uh, workable on something concrete. In order to do that, it's not enough government working on it and it's not enough uh, political leaders. We always say you need political commitment, which is, we agree, this is the reason why we are all here. Uh, but we need other actors. We worked a lot with the corporate sector. Water issues are very important for many, 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 many actors from the private sector. And they've been for many years considering this is not their business, issues of water and peace and, and how you better manage shared water. And then we're working with them. But this, even this is not enough. We need the youth, we need civil society, but we need simply the citizens being aware. And this is the reason why we want to transform this initiative in a movement. This is the reason why we're talking about movement is something that goes beyond what, what, uh, what a government or several governments can do. Of course, it, this is really, you can say, okay, you are a little bit asking for the moon. Yeah, 20 years ago when, uh, when we started, several of us started uh, the, this, this movement tentative movement on climate change related issues, we never imagined that we would 20 years after actually being at the brink to change the, the way the economies are functioning. And this is what we want to do with, with water. And the vehicle will be the shared responsibility and what is unifying us on water issues. Third and last uh, element, from, uh, you know, we are Swiss, so we are kind of pragmatic as well at the same time. We kept, we kept dreaming, this was the dream, but then pragmatically speaking, we introduced, we, we, we were really interested in introducing a concept of, um, put, it in a, put it in a blunt way, yeah? so sorry about that, I'll read, read simply for the conversation. What is the financial value of a peaceful agreement? I mean, <laughs> when, we, when you have countries that have been fighting for ages on, a, on a border issues and so on and so on, and then f one day they agree on a shared investment on water, how, what is the value in financial terms of this? I mean, can we help actors, financial actors, in intervening, in supporting this activity by de-risking measures or by other new measures? that are available in the, in the climate change sector, we have the green bonds and so on. I, are there measures that we can, we could uh, use or invent even in order to make investment flow into what are considered risky projects and programs? Because this at the end is key. We can have very nice conversation, we can come into an agreement, but they, if the, in this global public good, which is water, the investment are not coming, we might anyway fail in the long run. So these are the three elements. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Pio. I have a question for audience. Ambassador Venops just talked about real cooperation reflected in shared responsibility, shared projects uh, on transboundary waters where there are a lot of financial stakes. There is one part of the world which leads the entire world in creating solid financial stakes in uh, shared transboundary water projects. Can anyone guess which part of which continent it could be? Any guess? Sorry? Which part of Asia? Anybody here? 
you would think uh, Europe, maybe? North America? No, it's West Africa. The most advanced transboundary cooperation exists in West Africa. Senegal, Mali, Mauritania, Guinea, they commonly own all the water assets. There is no national sovereignty. This doesn't even exist in Europe. Common ownership and common management of uh, water assets. This is like a miracle in a world where there is a growing spirit of nationalism and ultranationalism. And we have <coughs> no other than the former Prime Minister of Guinea and the High Commissioner of uh, Senegal River Basin Organization to explain why West Africa is so advanced. And I must say, it's not only your Senegal River Basin uh, which you headed, but also the, uh, the Gambia River Basin Organization, which learned from you and has picked up and gone to the level, and the Niger uh, or Niger River Basin. How come, I mean, you have so many economic difficulties, you have so many tribal issues, but how is that you have gone so advanced in uh, transboundary water management with real financial stakes? Thank you, Sandeep. I'm privileged to be here to share this experience with you. In fact, let's go back to history. <coughs> uh, West African countries, mainly Guinea, Mali, Senegal, and Cote uh, uh, Mauritania, <coughs> were colonized by the French. They all became independent around 1958 for Guinea and two years later for the rest. At that time, they had visionary leaders governing those countries. They understood that uh, unless they cooperate, they cannot succeed. And Guinea being the water tank of West Africa, Guinea Conakry, we have 1,200 rivers in Guinea. It flows, it ran about four meters per year. And Guinea is being given birth to rivers going to Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Mali, Gambia, and Sierra Leone, and so on. So they decided a few years after they, they became independent that to switch agriculture, food sensitivity, energy, they need to share water. They created a unique organization called OMBS, which is based on two key pillars. First, the rivers is an international property. No single country can claim to be owner of one cubic meter. Secondly, any investment to be made in that river will be commonly shared and owned. Meaning that we don't share water per countries, but we share water according to the usage. So that was formed in 1972, headquartered in Dakar, made of the four countries. Today, the organization has been able to build three dams producing some 500 megawatts, and we have about 1,000 uh, potential megawatts in the river that are going to be developed. The organization is also sharing water for agriculture, irrigation among the four countries, and the assets are owned by the organization. We are supplying water to municipal cities. The city of Dakar is buying water from our dam. 60% of the water you consume in Dakar are sourced from our dam. 100% of the water used in Mauritania, capital city, is being bought from our dam. And in addition to that, we have a sanitation program across the four countries. We have health program, we have fishing program, and so on. Every three weeks, three months, we meet uh, farmers from the different countries energy producer, municipalities, and so on, we look at how the level should be shared among the different users. The electricity company will say, no, we need to produce such quantity to meet the demand. Uh, the navigation say, no, if you go that way, we'll be lacking high water in the river for the navigation, and, and we negotiate, and we agree on the parameters. And every three, three months, we agree, and we, we solve the problem. It has reached a point whereby where it is now going down to the municipalities and the localities. 
the cities and the villages are also now meeting to discuss how to strengthen that cooperation. It has spread over the continent, and uh, the African countries have created a network of Brazilian organization which has given to OMBS the leadership to host the headquarters. And then today, we are, our example is being used by many other countries in Africa. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Kumara. Uh, Ambassador uh, Saribe, in Central Asia, you have made a lot of efforts. You have the Interstate Coordination Committee of all the five stands. You have a very good fund for the protection of RLC. But you have not been able to go as far as the West African countries have been able to go. What do you see are the main challenges for cooperation in uh, uh, Central Asia? Uh, the water uh, humanity accepting as a granted, which is part of our life indeed, since it's uh, uh, a human right to have uh, the fresh water uh, resources free to take. But in uh, nowadays, we understand that water is not only uh, that should be considered not only as a weapon but also a source for interstate conflict or. Uh, the local conflict on the ground between the communities, which is the case, unfortunately, in uh, the past uh, in Central Asia, but also this is still a threat for the future. Just a uh, few years before, I think, uh, seven or eight years before, one of Central Asian uh, nation leader uh, said that if another uh, upstream country will not stop uh, the building uh, the dam, it will be uh, uh, the uh, reason for the war, for the uh, interstate war. Thanks to God, uh, this time is gone. Uh, nowadays in Central Asia, we do speak more about the cooperation, about the so-called integrated water management uh, with regional approach, but it's not easy. Uh, in Kazakhstan, we do have something like 50% uh, of uh, fresh water resources coming through transboundary river. It means that for us, Russia, China, Central Asia are upstream countries. Partially, uh, we are equal with Russia because we are upstream in terms of some uh, river basins like Yakutsk, which goes to less, uh, po uh, uh, less populated areas of Russia to Siberia to North Polar. So it means that we are very dependent to our neighbors, and that is why the policy of water, water policy was part of our multivectoral uh, comprehensive approach uh, within the diplomacy. Uh, we're struggling uh, for the uh, proper water management with all of our neighbors, and, and um, I have to admit uh, we're getting a good progress. At least uh, we established the uh, mechanism of uh, cooperation with Russia. Uh, China accepts our proposal to discuss the uh, transboundary water resources, how to manage it, how to keep it clean, how to share it, etc. Uh, but most complicated issue in Central Asia. We do have three uh, up, uh, downstream countries and two upstream countries. And I have to admit, in a former Soviet time, it was well uh, organized uh, management uh, ruled from out of Moscow, or from the Moscow, let me say. And all of local authorities in the republic, they just uh, got the orders and make the uh, actions. Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, unfortunately, uh, we were not able to continue this uh, well-organized uh, mechanism. Oh, well-organized is not uh, uh, probably the very correct word because despite this well-organization or well-management, uh, we lost RLT because of the mismanagement, because of uh, the uh, mega projects of the Soviet Union uh, rel uh, related to the water. Nowadays, we have five uh, independent states uh, with a different approach to the freshwater resources. Some of them saying that the water is the subject to, uh, to sell, is the subject to own. Uh, upstream countries says, uh, if you're selling us oil, which is the natural product, 
we are in a position to sell you the water. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, most complicated issue. Uh, they are poor enough in other natural resources, but they are rich very much in, 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 a, fresh and in a fresh water resources. And this try and fuse two situations. Uh, we have to understand that it's many stakeholders. It's not only agriculture, it's not only industry, it's not only uh, municipalities or communities which use <coughs> the water, it's many others. Uh, and to bring all this uh, under one umbrella, uh, Kazakhstan initiated to establish the Water Energy Consortium as well as Food Security Consortium, because all of them are very well related. Uh, the political situation on the ground is also was not conducive to agree, despite the fact that uh, uh, all five, uh, as you mentioned, stun uh, countries were able to agree to establish uh, the International Fund uh, to save Aral Sea. Uh, within this mechanism, uh, the uh, matter of transboundary water resources wasn't on the agenda because of these political issues, because of the political tensions. Uh, upstream countries refused to put on the agenda of this uh, International Fund uh, the discussion how we will provide the water resources to Aral Sea to, to in order to save it. Uh, nowadays, uh, I have to say that the political climate in Central Asia turns to a doctor. Uh, I do believe that uh, with these uh, new uh, moments in, the, in Central Asia, uh, we can agree that uh, the joint integrated water management is in a benefit of all nations. That we can agree how to uh, manage it better, that the limited uh, resources would be well shared. And the tools, uh, and totally agree with uh, the approach that uh, President Turk uh, already uh, wrote or uh, said uh, last year to the uh, UN Security Council that first we have to think about uh, the principle of the nexus water and security, uh, which is absolutely in line of the proposed uh, approach of my president. He said that development, nexus between development and peace, uh, how we can get uh, the better uh, integrated water management uh, only by the green technologies, by advanced technologies, reducing water uh, intensive uh, industries or agriculture by uh, other means, by the uh, uh, resource saving uh, measures, etc. So this is the idea, but uh, for all that programs, you need to fund. And uh, it's not a coincidence that World Bank was uh, recruited to make the expertise on the uh, uh, Rogon Dam uh, because that was more neutral one, most neutral one, and second, uh, the World Bank, uh, in case, could uh, propose another uh, technical or financial solution, how to, uh, we can uh, solve the issue, the problem. So I think that this nexus, we have to understand, we have to agree that water is a, a shared uh, natural resource. Uh, the uh, water and security nexus is uh, in indivisible. This is absolutely uh, correct. Uh, and we have to think how we will uh, proper use these limited resources for the benefits of all. And this, is, this goes through the green technologies, advanced technologies, and for that we need international partners. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So far, I think you have all uh, made a very convincing argument for promoting water cooperation. The other point you made, Tanilo Turk, in your uh, uh, initial comments, was that water is also being used as, a, as an instrument of war. Uh, it's being used as a target. Uh, it's being used as a, uh, uh, as a means of warfare by terrorist groups, by uh, others. Now, an interesting development took place in the last few months. ISIS, or Daesh, 
whatever name you prefer, was undoubtedly one of the most deadly terrorist organizations that, uh, besides Al-Qaeda, that's been there for the last few years. Until April, ISIS was invincible. It looked like it's going to spread its wings everywhere. Suddenly, ISIS has lost 90% of its territory, and ISIS is on the process of being wiped out. I think ISIS as a network might exist, but ISIS as an organization will be over by December this year. There's absolutely no doubt about it. What is that one thing that happened in May which changed everything? What changed everything was that ISIS had a control over Tapka Dam, which is the largest dam in Syria, and it was using that dam to house its uh, leadership, to uh, have its tax office and create revenues, to generate electricity and sell it to the Assad regime so in the black market, and to uh, preserve its high-value prisoners. <coughs> and, 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 and ISIS was sure that NATO or anybody would not be able to uh, attack the Tapka Dam, because if you did that, if you bomb the Tapka Dam, you would flood the whole of Syria and create humanitarian crisis. But international coalition was able to evict ISIS, and after that, ISIS is, being, is disappearing. But they did it in collaboration with another terrorist group, or a group which is uh, controversial, is considered a terrorist by the Turkish state, uh, is considered a freedom fighter by some other, it's a YPG, but a group which has been using uh, weapons. Aaron, I don't know if you love or hate Donald Trump, <laughs> but this was one of the uh, disguised initiatives of Trump, which has not been much in the media since uh, January. But you're doing work on ethics of transboundary water relations. How do you manage a situation where terrorist groups control a dam in a vital area like Syria or Iraq, and you take help of at least, let's say, non-state violent actors to evict one terrorist group and you put another non-state violent actor in it. Uh, and with the US soldiers uh, wearing the fatigues of YPG and appearing in this uh, operation, uh, how do you manage the ethical issues? So. The last thing I'm going to try and do is speak on behalf of Donald Trump, if that's <laughs> if that's okay. Um, I, I will mention. Uh, I, I think a bit of a bit of history is useful because I think that a number of things have come up here that are, are powerfully important. One is that how this this issue has been elevated in the 25 years or so that that I've been doing this. This panel wouldn't have even been uh, and, and unimaginable when I first started in early 1990s. When anybody was talking about shared waters, it was very few people, uh, shared water and security, it was very few people primarily in the security world who had suddenly discovered water resources and primarily they were using it as an excuse to perpetuate their budgets at the end of the Cold War. They were looking around basically for something to do. And they came ac across this idea of environmental security, the wars of the 21st century would be about water resources. And militaries around the world, including the United States, got very excited about this idea because it meant that they wouldn't have to cut their budgets. It meant there would be no peace dividend. It meant there we, we wouldn't have to spend on things like education or social services or anything like that. So that was one wave uh, that came across. And, and in response to that, this is just about the time that, that I got involved. I'm trained prim initially as a scientist and I got interested in what were the assumptions, what was the data being used when people said something like the wars of the 21st century would be about something. Well, the data points were six. Everybody at the time was pointing to the Indus, the Nile, the Ganges, uh, uh, Brahmaputra, the Jordan, Tigris, Euphrates, and, and Nile. And they were saying, look, these people hate each other anyway. They're running out of water. Therefore, <coughs> there would be war. And so I asked, what do we know? What do we know? And as a scientist, I did what scientists do. We started to count things. We started to compile treaties. We started to compile events of two states doing anything around water resources. We started to get actual data worldwide, not just those six case studies, but any event in the last 60 years. And what we found, just doing that, just counting things was fascinating. One, there was almost no violent uh, conflict across borders at all. In fact, you have to go back 4,500 years to the only documented war between city-states specifically around water resources. It was a city-state of Lagash and Uman, 2500 BC. 
So that's interesting. The six case studies that we'll be pointing to, in fact, as we, we've seen in all of the cases that have been mentioned, yes, there was a period that was conflictive where people threatened war, and not just in, in Central Asia, but on the Nile Basin war was threatened. Politicians, excuse me, tend to threaten war. They're not talking to the other side for the most part. They're generally talking to, to their own constituents for internal political reasons. So if you look, did armies mobilize? Were the, the, the reserves called up? Did anybody move any material? Almost no violent conflict across borders. And in contrast to that, close to 600 treaties signed between uh, co-riparians or countries that share water resources around the world. So you have these 600 treaties, you have seven, 14 uh, uh, shots being fired, uh, armies being mobilized. That in and of itself is interesting. So what we've seen is a, is, a, is a timeline of sorts around water resources, shared water resources, where something happens. Somebody builds something, generally upstream. Downstream countries get very concerned. And there's a period that's very bellicose, that, that there's a lot of tension. And primarily, again, the politicians and the press get very excited about the possibility of, of conflict. And then what happens is one of the most powerful things, and, and the, the excitement of this panel for me, because up till now, it's been, it's been low-level panels. This is at the low level. People come together. That crisis brings people together. And people do what they do best. They problem solve. They think creatively. The technical people and the political people <coughs> come into the same room and they say, how do we get out of this? How, how do we de-escalate and how do we manage the resources in a way that's beneficial? And so this, this period from conflict to intense cooperation, now that, I should mention, takes 10 or 20 or 30 years to negotiate, but then generally results in very, very powerful agreements like the OMBS uh, that generally countries don't uh, pull away from once they've, they've entered into them. So that history in and of itself is, is, is hugely, uh, I think, an optimistic one. And, and, and the fact that that argument that water more than, it is a, a, a possibility of conflict, but more than that, it's an opportunity for dialogue and peacemaking. And it brings people into a room where they won't talk about anything else. It, it keeps them at the table when they won't talk about anything else. is a powerful, powerful message. Now, what, what, the, what the question that you asked, Sandeep, is, is a separate and related question. We know that people have a tendency to work towards cooperative solutions around their shared water. States do. At the sub-state level, we have precisely the problems you're describing. There are a lot of violent conflict within countries, tribal conflict, ethnic violence, uh, uh, non-state actors. Uh, who are very happy to do all the things that countries don't tend to do uh, to be violent ar around. And this, I think, is, is something where the security world and the, the water world can lead either to a downward spiral or an uphill spiral. And the downward spiral is what we're seeing in places now like Syria, uh, South Sudan, uh, Yemen, where the drought causes political uh, um, vulnerability, which in turn impacts the infrastructure necessary to deal with the drought and, and, and cycling down and down and down until you have uh, <coughs> humanitarian crises. And so if, if on the one hand, I'm, I'm so delighted to, to see this and to hear, to see at what level this, these issues have been elevated uh, in the last several years, and I'm more delighted than that to hear that there are the two tracks. The one track is to encourage the peacemaking between countries, to encourage the dialogue between countries. But at the sub-national level, within the national level, the simplest solution is, unsexy though it is, poverty alleviation. Simply helping people come out of poverty, helping with infrastructure, helping get access to safe, stable supply of water resources ends up being the best security weapon we have in those particular cases. Thank you. So thank you, uh, thank you, Aaron. I mean, you, you are right that in last 100 years, some 600 treaties have been signed uh, between the states. But the point is that from uh, 2001 to 2010, in 10 years, there were 25 terrorist attacks on water infrastructures in different parts of the world. <coughs> and from 2011 to 2015, there were 25 terrorist attacks in the Middle East alone on water infrastructure. So we are getting into 
uh, a new new uh, evil era, so to say, uh, in the management of uh, security of the water infrastructure. Danilo, this subject has been dealt with uh, uh, by the panel very extensively, and at the cost of uh, 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 revealing a few things that you are going to present a week from now in Geneva, why don't you throw some light on how this can be uh, handled? Uh, I'd like to come back to your question about ethics in war, you know, and that, that of course is a very good point of departure because we all understand that war by definition is a very cynical, unethical enterprise. And probably the only good thing about war is that it ends at some point. All wars end sooner or later, usually after many, many years. Now, this brings me to three specific situations. One is Syria. You mentioned Tabqa Dam. Sure, uh, that was a cynical calculation because on the one hand, uh, ISIS was holding this population hostage and the military enemies in check. But the coalition knew that the population downstream, in the downstream area, would be supportive of ISIS in normal circumstances. And ISIS would lose support immediately if it blew up the dam. So, I mean, you know, it was a cynical military uh, calculation which ended with taking over of the Tabqa Dam uh, in a way which did not produce a humanitarian disaster. So, so far, so good. But you also mentioned that since YPG was involved in that, that opened up new series of problems. And of course, these have to be resolved in the post-conflict period when the whole uh, issue will be between Turkey, Syria, and Iran. And all of them will have to figure out a cooperative arrangement for the future. And this is not going to be easy because if you ask Turkey, what do they think about the future? They would say, well, you know, we are always told to give more water to downstream countries and they don't do their part of the job to, to, to produce the kind of infrastructure which would utilize water resources wisely. If you talk to the Syrians, we'll say, we always have problems with Turkey because they do not cooperate with us in a way which would be beneficial to us and so forth. And then when it comes to, to Iraq, you will learn, for example, that um, salination of the area of Euphrates and Tigris, the oldest agricultural area in the world, has, uh, has deteriorated so much that now the crop yields in that area are only 50% of global average, 50% only. So there is a need for massive investment for you know, recovery of the land, and that should be part of the peace project. That, that's also about poverty alleviation and, and everything. So one has to bring the entire um, spectrum of problems into the picture in order to comprehend the, the, the richness of nexus between water and peace and think about post-conflict situation uh, in, that, in that sense. Because you know, uh, when wars end, the problems of water cooperation start at a new level and they have to be addressed and they have to solutions have to emerge. And when it comes to Geneva, what's your <coughs> key global recommendation? Well, <coughs> there will be several, but I would focus only on one, and that is improve the financial instruments for transboundary water cooperation. We know that this is not something that can be dealt with in a very simplistic, direct way, we would need to create what financial people call safe space or you know, appropriate space for financial operations. In other words, there will be a need for preliminary consultations among stakeholders, states and non-state actors. Somebody has to help developing that space, which then in turn makes investment easier. So there is a need for a prior or preliminary activity which is not taking place nowadays uh, but is vital if one wants to if one wants to move the uh, transboundary water cooperation further it is true that there are some successes and they generally were a result of wise leadership of people in the area but sometimes assistance is needed and that assistance is not only in terms of money finance is more than money finance is also providing a space for appropriate consultations that make 
financial investment possible. And that's going to be one of the key recommendations. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Pio, you have a lot of experience with the financial sector. What's the possibility for you know, some of the successful experience from the corporate finance where you use principles like ESG or recent experience of green bonds, both from the private sector as well as from the World Bank and others. What's the possibility for applying some of these lessons to creating new financial uh, mechanisms for promoting transboundary uh, cooperation? Thank you, Sandeep. I would love to, to, to have the possibility to give you a very fast and straightforward answer. I'm afraid it's not that easy. The first element that is needed is that what kind of infrastructure are we going to support and to finance in the future? Because when we're being supporting as a Swiss agency for direct cooperation many years now to shift from an administrative to an hydrographic way of managing uh, river basins, this implies a completely another way of looking at infrastructure. So if you take one of the problems, I mean, I've been, I mean, I'm not, of course, I'm not a super deeper expert, but I traveled extensively in my 25 years, and I worked um, recently also, I was several times in Uzbekistan, in Pakistan, and so on. The problem is that it's not that easy to do, to move from one concept where you have a centralized system, oversized infrastructure, and then you have to take decision to downsize, and you don't know to what kind of choice am I going to make? What kind of 8,000 kilometers of channels for agriculture I'm, go I'm going to keep or not to keep? Um, it's not an easy, an, easy, an easy decision. And I, I see there one of the major obstacles in making agreements among, among different, uh, different countries. So the point is that when, when and most of the countries are affirmed recently, they want to go with integrated water management systems. Okay, what does it mean concretely? M it means that you move from this centralized and administratively run kind type of super duper investment into something where you get users on board, their voice, other actors. This is the re reason why I was saying in the beginning, we want to transform it in a movement. And therefore, even, even the investment plan start to change. Example. I was in Pakistan, and then we had to discuss. There was a discussion whether to make a big dam in KP, or whether to make an investment with several hundred or small, uh, small uh, energy plants down the river from KP to Punjab. And this is a political decision. It's not an easy one because it's easier. It's easier. I say it's not easier at all. But you think that with one big dam will solve the problem. <laughs> this is the tendency <laughs> again. But actually, most of the case, this is not. This is not the case. So the point is: first, you need to have a, uh, and therefore we insist so much on this blue piece process because even before starting, what kind of instrument I can bring financial means I have to agree on a plan that is going to make the best use of of the of the of the financial resources. If not, there will be nobody coming, even if I do it, even if I put guarantee schemes, blue bonds, uh, taking in charge international community, thirty percent of the first investment in case you come back to a war or something like this. These are all options that can be used Blue bonds, we're talking about this. Maybe in the future we can, we can go in this direction and try one or two cases. But you need that the investment plan is actually something that is related to the future. Is, by the way, the opportunity to take on board all the sustainable development agenda. This is the reason why we're talking ESG. And I'm really happy that the panel is taking on board the financial issues, not as generally we say we need trillions of investment, but we will need quality of financial investment. Therefore, the ESG, the environmental, social, and a governance principle that can be extended to peaceful agreements, uh, need to have on board the right actors of the financial systems. So therefore, targeting, even if it's a niche today, but targeting those banks and those financial uh, institutions that have already been working, have been working for 20 or more years in defining a new way to support this kind of uh, funding. And this is, I think, is the great work that, uh, that the, the, the panel has done in the financial part. Uh, 
in Central Asia, as you said, you have had difficulties in cooperating between upstream and downstream. And uh, at one stage, you were even talking about, uh, you know, I mean, some countries or some people were talking about the risk of war. To what extent do you think can the force of money help to bring about uh, common approaches and more cooperation in the region? Money uh, is a very conducive uh, substance, uh, especially, uh, again, uh, if we putting it in the form of development aid, this is uh, most welcome uh, issue for those especially uh, who are struggling with the lack of finance. And uh, before I will go uh, straight to uh, the, the matter, I would like to say that we uh, first uh, went through this path uh, by using uh, the international uh, organizations and uh, some uh, countries as a donor just to recover the situation on North Aral. And I have to admit that uh, uh, it was not easy because it was some preconditions. Uh, it was not a blue bond or green bond uh, concept at that time. It was just uh, the preconditions that the government will co-finance and the government will manage properly uh, in order to bring to the normalcy the situation on, uh, on Aralsi. Uh, and that was also not uh, just as granted because the international community realized <coughs> the threats of RLC because uh, the salt of RLC was seen even in, Tita in Tibet. So this is the quite uh, practical solution how to do it. And we were able with the uh, assistance of international organizations and uh, donor countries uh, to uh, bring to success around 70 international projects Nowadays in North Aral, uh, we can see that fishery is still there or uh, returned to, to the vicinity. We solved many social problems. Uh, and we increased, uh, for instance, the agricultural crops. So that was, as uh, President Turk just said, uh, one uh, positive effect of this kind of uh, proper water management with the uh, assistance of international community. So I think that SDGs was mentioned, uh, uh, the, the, the solutions. SDGs uh, is not also just a goal. We have to define the ways how we will get them. And the only thing I think it's uh, the, the regional cooperation. Uh, SDGs you should not consider only as uh, within the national borders. It's transpondary as, as the water resources as well. So that is why uh, we're trying to uh, initiate this kind of regional approach to achieve the SDGs. And we're taking the very uh, pragmatical ways. Uh, you cannot <coughs> insist uh, the sovereign state to do properly that or that according to your mind. But if you offer the development, if you offer the aid uh, with technologies, with financing, that will be well received and uh, no one will dominate to another. So uh, the practical ways uh, that my government uh, is undertaking is uh, conducting expo uh, devoted to the theme energy, future energy, which means also uh, the uh, water resources because uh, in our part of the world, water is source for the energy for upstream countries. Uh, and on the uh, ground of the expo, uh, we would like to establish the International Center for Green Technologies and Investment. And uh, along that, uh, we already adopted the special constitutional law uh, providing the legal the basis for the establishment of International Financial Center with one branch uh, devoted to green technologies, with green bones. And all this we do think will conducive to solve the problem. The idea is to have in Central Asia water resources uh, uniting people, uh, the source of integration, the major, uh, the, the, the very solid pillar for regional integration as it was steel and coal in Europe uh, a few decades before. So this is uh, the uh, goal, <coughs> and that is why Kazakhstan is quite open to international cooperation. That is why we're waiting, we are very curious uh, to the 
uh, outcomes of the panel, uh, what kind of recommendations that will uh, bring, because uh, high officials of Kazakhstan also participating at the panel meeting. Uh, and uh, we just talk about uh, the possibility to see it again uh, on Security Council meeting. Why not? Uh, because one of the priority of our campaign for Security Council seat was along with uh, a nuclear, uh, a nuclear uh, safety, uh, food security, uh, energy security, the water security was one of the pillars of our campaign. So I'm uh, rather optimistic. But uh, to be honest, within the OECE, for instance, is another uh, regional uh, security arrangement. Uh, we are not able even to put the name of water management because of the opposition of some uh, fellow uh, countries from uh, Central Asia. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, the, this is the reality. But if you put the financial uh, uh, development aid, uh, if you bring uh, investment and technologies, that will be well received, and I'm sure that is the key solution to the uh, issue. So are you suggesting that the aid to Tajikistan for building the Rogun Dam should be made uh, conditional to cooperation with other countries? Uh, it's your perception. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you a less tough question, but still difficult. Uh, are you open to seeking intellectual cooperation from the West African countries as to how they managed it? That would be very great. Uh, and we're advocating that uh, we have to study the all, maybe uh, not all, but at least the, the best uh, practice, international practices that will lead to better uh, integrated water management. And West Africa could be exemplary if you're saying that, that it's, it's true, definitely. We are open to seek any kind of uh, good advices from everywhere. Thank you. You mentioned uh, Mr. Kumara, so you have a task after this, but I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, I want to open now for the, uh, for the participants on this side of the uh, room. Vuk Jugik, how do you pronounce it? Correct? Huh? Good, OK, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you work with OSC, and Kara just mentioned OSC. Can you mention in, uh, in, uh, in a couple of points as to what are the main challenges you see to promote uh, water cooperation in the OSC region? Well, definitely. Maybe you stand so they can uh, see. Is there, a, is there a microphone for him? No, it's fine. It's coming. It's coming. OK. Well, thanks. Thanks for giving me the floor, and uh, I'm very pleased to be today here listening to this topic, which is the, one of the topics which we are very often discussed in the OSC. And OSC is the largest security organization, regional security organization, for those who are not aware, stretching from North America to Asia. Uh, yes, we have several challenges, but also we are seeing that uh, water cooperation and good water governance. It's part of uh, core of our mandate, which is to prevent conflicts and to promote security. And through this, we believe that this is a quite good confidence building measure, which we try to do. As my good friend Kairat was just mentioned, of course, among 57 participating states, it's very difficult to obtain the consensus sometimes because it's enough that one of them is not ready to support. But our task is to assist the participating states, to help them mainly through projects to work and to change and to shape perhaps some new thinking. And our projects are uh, stretching from the regions of Central Asia, South Caucasus, Southeastern Europe, Eastern Europe. And all of this, all of this at this very moment is also something what I have to go back to Kairat. Uh, it's a part of our regional support to the Agenda 2030, to the particularly SDG 6, who is dealing with water. On the challenges, what we faced and what we can say as a lessons learned from our point of view were that the <clears throat> this issue, water diplomacy or water governance, is a, a very long-term project or assessment. You can't have 
positive things very quickly. I mean, it would be very great, but this is, at least through our experience, is not the case. Basically, it's a multi-layer or multi-level uh, uh, approach, meaning that you have to talk to the national, international, and also re uh, local uh, structures, because sometimes this is very much important. And in that you have to take what our Swiss colleagues just mentioned in the beginning, all stakeholders, including non-governmental sector, including civil society, including business community and others. And this, what is important is that, in a way, uh, this might contribute for better and more security, what I learned from uh, professor, and this is also our analysis, rarely it's an issue of conflict among states. But that does not mean that there are no conflicts. It, we have to also be aware of that. So we are uh, trying to be also very much open in our projects with our international partners. We discussed, uh, Mr. Moderator, before this panel on the activities within the MSEC, with the other international organizations who are our partners like UNEC, like UNDP, UNEP and others. And this is a really uh, purely very strong and large multilateral effort in order that we come back or try to assess that the water really is part for peace and can promote uh, security. Of course, cooperation there is very much needed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Juzik. Yes. Anybody else? Uh, yes, please. Please uh, take a microphone. <coughs> and if you can just introduce yourself. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael Doman. I'm coming from University of Ljubljana. I was working many, many years on water, mainly from biological, ecological point of view. So what I miss in such panels and conferences and meetings is also the um, um, broader understanding what water means, not only for the human being, but what water means globally. And what I like to express, it's very important first to understand the water bodies, the water environment, and then make so-called political will and political decision. This is very, very important. And if I stress uh, especially, Slovenia is one of the, I don't know, three or four countries in the world so we have water in our Constitution Act. But this is a political, uh, how to say, decision. It's not so uh, scientific or, um, how to say, um, knowledge decision about the water. So what we need to understand is that global water and global cooperation is very, very important. And I do not understand exactly why so many uh, scientists are working in one side and politicians in the other side. And the gap between us and I can say between you, because I'm not a politician, is wider and wider. And I don't know how to get together. I was in your country, in Kazakhstan, as also as a part of scientific expedition in RLC. And RLC is one of my favorite, uh, how to say, work. And also in Moynak uh, accumulation in the south. And I know that it is important how to negotiate. And, but first, you have to know uh, um, uh, what is knowledge. And that water is not only for drinking water for security. Water is not only for irrigation, for security, and of course not for electricity. Water is more than only drinking water. And this is um, a part I want to discuss, and I'm very glad to be part of this panel and, of course, distinguished panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Worldwide, only uh, five or six percent of the water is consumed mm -hmm. on an average for household purpose. That includes drinking, bathing, uh, 
municipal water, everything. Another 7 or 8 percent for industry, and more than 70 percent for agriculture or for irrigation. So it's really maximum use of water is really for irrigation and then hydroelectricity and nowadays the moving to, to uh, urbanization. Uh, there is a question that comes from your comment for Aaron, but before that, let me see if, uh, uh, yes, uh, please. From the Hello, my name is Mariana Dermil. I'm coming from Government Office for Development and European Cohesion Policy. I have a question related to land and water grabbing. We all know that this is coming or it already is an issue and I would like to know how the international um, community is addressing this issue and trying to prevent the negative um, implication of this. Thank you. Because there's a water underneath. It happens in other parts of Africa, not west part of Africa. So you have to Yes. How to deal with it? Thank you very much. It is a complicated question because uh, in most African countries, we are lacking a proper uh, legal uh, land uh, system. We are governed mainly by traditional rulers about how to allocate land. And today for development, we need to securitize uh, the investor, if they want them, to want them to invest. So as a result, you have mixed situation. In some countries, a centralized government say, okay, the government owns, the state owns all the land, and they can grab and allocate to what they want. In other countries, you have a superposition of traditional rules and modern law. As a result, if I take a country like Senegal, which is one, one of the more advanced, Despite the fact that the government has a very comprehensive plan to develop agriculture, they are still facing the issue of how to negotiate with traditional owner of the land and pass it on to modern investors. The case is more complicated in Mali, that is a country that has been very much gifted of huge uh, hectare of urban land, where you have along the river Niger, huge uh, quantity of land that have been irrigated, and the local people cannot use all of them. And the government want to attract investors. And today you have conflict whereby some NGO are challenging the government decision for allocating part of those land to uh, international investors from Saudi Arabia, from Japan. So you have a situation whereby people are saying, okay, why are we keeping those land, land idly? You cannot use them. At the same time, you can attract investors who will not only produce, but will also create um, employment. So the debate is on. From country to country, I have no solution to tell. But in my own country, Guinea, the situation is that uh, we are in a situation where we have a huge quantity of land. We, need, we, we lack financing to make them accessible by irrigation and the traditional road. But basically what you are saying is what you need is a legal reform. Absolutely. And, and proper legal framework. Pio, you want to add anything? Yes, thank you. I try fast. Uh, on land grabbing, after the 2008 food security crisis, what we did, a group of countries, we supported the development of, uh, of voluntary guidelines on land tenure on the one hand, on the other hand, responsible investment in agriculture principle. These are, of course, not hard laws, but these are guiding principles and have been taken up meanwhile by more than 50 countries in order to exactly work on the uh, legal issues. And the guidelines are being developed starting from the 50 years experiences that, uh, that several of us had, in, uh, including in, uh, in, in Africa. And, um, and also, also in Europe and in other countries. And one of the concrete effects of this is that, for instance, the agreement of, uh, of, uh, um, between South Korea and Madagascar to, to call it grab, one million of hectares of arable land, this was, this was dismissed at the end by the, by the government themselves. So there are even concrete aspects to this. I'd, I'd like to, uh, yep.
Chaudhary from India. I have a rather naive question. Uh, over the last five decades, uh, we have been able to reasonably achieve democratization of energy. It seemed impossible a few decades ago. What is the prospect of democratization of water? Can science help? We know its composition. What's the progress in that direction? What is the progress on desalinization? What is the progress on artificial rain making and creating water inside? Because there's enough water vapor in the air. So what, can all this lead to making these problems relatively irrelevant? Uh, Aaron, you want to answer this particular question? The other one will come yeah, back later. Yeah, I, I think this is the tendency whenever we talk about water, and it goes to the professor's point that we, we the technical people and the political people don't talk to each other. And so when generally when we talk about water, the assumption is if only we had more of it, the problems would go away. And it's not true. Uh, in the southeast United States, there are three states. You get meters of rain every year. Big water places have big water problems. They're about hydropower and they're about transportation. The trick is not all the things you mentioned, great advances in desalinization, cloud seeding, all these things, more crop per drop, all of that's happening at the margins. The key is with the intersection of the technical and the political. So that when water, as soon as water crosses a border, the, the, the cost of the water is practically irrelevant. It, there's this truism, we train facilitators, we train people both in the technical and in the dipl diplomatic side. We have a wonderful new program with three universities, University of Peace and us and IHE, and there's a truism in mediation. The issue is never the issue. When we're talking about water, we're generally talking about history, we're talking about sovereignty, we're talking about power, we're talking about, we're talking about bloodlines, we're talking about all kinds of other things. The one word that we don't mention often and hasn't been mentioned here yet today, we're talking about spirituality. Just give a sense, I'm not gonna ask what religion you are, but if you, if you ask yourself, please raise your hand if in your religion, water is a component of spiritual transformation. Please. Some of you are too shy to do this. The answer is all of your traditions, all of your traditions tap into it. That's an opportunity to help elevate these conversations. And in my part of the world, when we're sitting around the table with the tribes, with the, with the, the ranchers, with the farmers, the fact that it is a spiritual, there is spiritual component to it in all of our traditions helps us elevate this conversation. So here I, I, would, I would, I guess my, my answer is there's a lot of great things happening technically happening, and that's almost besides the point. The point is, how do you have better conversations? How do you learn to listen to each other? How do you under, learn to understand? And with the technical, we can find the nuance to allow for both sides of a political dispute to find their way to gain from whatever project's on the table. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Can somebody give him the mic? My name is Sasha Wertes from the Peace Academy Rhineland Palatinate. And I just have one question, and thanks for the panelists um, for the interesting points. Um, when the subnational level and the subnational actors are one of the major problems, where at least water issues are a driver to conflict, to violent conflict, what can we do to make the water issue more transparent in the peace negotiation process? Because what is my mindset is when we come to peace process, fragile peace movement, peace uh, contracts, the water issue never is up on the table. It's power management, it's demilitarization, certain kind of issues, but never the resource issue or the water issue. Are there good practices in that sense to share among um, other uh, upcoming events or peace process? Actually here, where we are sitting right now, after the, uh, the, the Balkan Wars of the 90s, the first agreement which was entered in by the countries here was the Sava River Agreement, mm. which helped to build peace and uh, prospect. So water issue was right up front, right on the top. Maybe Danilo, you can elaborate a little bit. Well, this is, I, don't th I don't think this is necessary. You know, Sava is a tributary to Danube. And of course, Danube system has a very long history of water cooperation. So it was quite natural for the riparian countries of Sava River to come together. Now, the interesting thing there is that the culture of post-conflict atmosphere was that 
this is probably the most direct, most immediate uh, task to be, uh, to be put on the table. And an interesting thing is, that, of course, it was not purely an initiative of the riparian countries. It was assisted from the European Union and was, you know, it was an international project. Uh, and of course, there were funny elements in the process because, as you can, as you probably know, uh, this is an area where languages are similar, but people are also very insistent on on their linguistic identities. So that created a problem in the negotiation process. And then, at the end, they they agreed that they will use uh, what they called a Sava language, without mentioning any version of Serbo-Croat, uh, but only, you know, kind of objectively referring to Sava River as the unifying factor, which even helped resolving the linguistic problem in the negotiating process. Now, I find this not only amusing, but also very encouraging. Uh, and of course, this is not the only example where, uh, where peace processes included water. I mean, if you take the Jordan-Israel peace agreement, it has, a, it has an annex on, on water. It, of course, you know, one can argue that this was not very effectively uh, implemented, but still, it, it was there in the uh, Darfur talks. There was the water element was included, and so on. So there is some of that. Uh, I will come to some advertising work a little later because several questions that were raised relate directly to what we are saying in our report. But I will advertise the report a little later. Yes. Yeah, so for commercials. Uh, uh, but one last intervention from the audience, the young lady here, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have two questions and a comment to make. Um, one of the All questions is... in one is, minute. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, maybe 30 seconds. Okay, so I'm more interested to learn about the, um, what do you mean by financial instruments? Because maybe I'm, I'm a little naive here, I don't understand what you mean by that. Um, then, I mean, have you looked at in your report on water as a migration issue? Because we see climate change dr uh, driven migration and water might be one of those because um, in, in history we have seen like people would only settle around water. So if we are going to get this water scarcity, so what will be the migration trends and how would that be a security issue? between countries maybe. Um, and then I have some issues with using the term terrorism, uh, terrorists uh, using uh, water and everything. It's because uh, this term does not have any definition right now. For me, anybody curtailing the right of water of another human is also terrorism because that too is, 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 is spreading terror. So I mean, just, just to say that for me, um, as, as a scholar of peace and conflict, so I find this word being used like way too much without its meaning. Thank you. Well, uh, before I ask the panelists, the answer to your first question on the financial uh, issues uh, is that you are invited to Geneva uh, on the 14th. I can promise you uh, a free copy of the report uh, on behalf of uh, PO. I can also promise you a free glass of wine on behalf of PO. So that's for the for, for answer to the first question. Uh, the answer to the third question I have to ask the Slovenian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs whether we can start another panel on terrorism and uh, it, whether it's a right word or wrong, or wrong word uh, uh, on that. Uh, but to, but a brief answer is that there is no general assembly endorsed definition of terrorism, yeah. but there is a definition of terrorism which has been proposed by several UN uh, committees which. Uh, uh, which I can uh, later on tell you in a uh, coffee break where to find it. And, and, and the last point, that there are UN Security Council resolutions which designate certain groups as ter ter terrorist groups, like uh, UNSCR 1387 and other resolution numbers. But I can, I can give you more details later. Uh, uh, but let me uh, now come back because we have, uh, we have five minutes and uh, we have... Uh, uh, five uh, speakers on the panel, and they get one minute each. Uh, the last, if one of, if you, if each one of you can uh, voluntarily offer 15 seconds to Danilo to add to his commercials, that will be highly appreciated. So we go to you last, uh, Danilo, but start with Aaron. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I, just to, to sum, the the program that we have at Oregon State, the, it's called the Program in Water conflict management and transformation. And as I mentioned, it has three components that may be useful to people doing work 
further. One is the database. As I said, we, we've been collecting things for 25 years, and as soon as we get something, we try and make it available. We have all the treaties, they're coded, uh, a ton of, of good information that's there uh, that is it's accessible. The second is the training, and we're really excited about this because my experience in doing this work, people need to be explicitly trained both in diplomacy and in conflict management and in water resources. You really need to understand the nuance of both in order to do this work effectively. And there's a, a great group of, of water champions coming up through the ranks, and we're very excited about that. And the, the third, the, I think the most exciting thing I've heard, I, I work, the third component is we do facilitations and mediations around the world at international scale, but also at the local scale. And in that capacity, the most exciting thing I've heard is this idea of safe space. I've been involved in these issues a, a couple of times uh, in these settings, and that's precisely what's necessary. Somebody has a... a, a your time is up. <laughs> your time is up. And it was mostly used for a commercial. So, so, so I, have to be, I have to be fair to everybody else. Mr. Kumara, you have a commercial also. No, I, I, I've tried to respond to what she said about... Uh, is that no. Is that a commercial or is that serious? No, no, it's serious. <laughs> uh, linkage between uh, uh, climate change and migration. Most of the time, here in Europe, you think migration about moving from Africa to Europe. But migration is more important within Africa. Two-thirds of migrants are moving from one African country to another. And we are facing a more challenging migration element by the fact that the northern part of Africa are lacking gradually of water. The rainfall are diminishing. And people are growing down to the coast area. And it's creating a lot of problems because those who are raising cattle that are moving down, bringing their cattle to the, the area where we have grass, and there are conflicts between agriculture, farmers, and uh, cattle raisers. And gradually also, cities close to the coast are being densely, densely populated. It's creating a lot of problems. So that element is one of the elements that we are discussing about among ECOWAS countries today. It has become very, very frightening. I just want to add that element to the water issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, word? So my commercial. But first, remind always, people as being on the move since the Neolithic. So it's not something new. The second one, please, join and make other people join the Blue Peace as a movement, as a global movement. Make this become a global movement. So answers to questions that be raised from different parts can be taken on board. It's not about Geneva, it's not about Blad, it's not about New York. It's about transforming this small energy that came from all of us into a movement. Please talk to your daughter, sister, parents to join. Thanks. I think that Kazakhs uh, still uh, good nomads. Uh, that is why the water indeed for us very uh, sacral things. Uh, that is why we are very keen to have international cooperation on water management. We are very keen to uh, look to the best practices. That is why I'm very uh, curious uh, what we can uh, hear in a few days in Geneva, uh, what kind of uh, uh, production uh, you will do. It's my just uh, preparation to the major commercial. Thank you very much to organizers for inviting us. Uh, the water is a uh, quite significant part of our life. And as a ninth territory in the world, Kazakhstan is very keen to introduce, to input, to make its own input to this issue. Thank you. Now, Danilo, before, before you make your announcement, I must use the privilege of being a moderator here to make another commercial. You referred to the water cooperation quotient in, the, in your opening remarks, which is a study of all the 286 uh, shared river basins in the world. And which shows that any two countries engaged in active water cooperation do not go to war at all. If you want to see the details, www.strategicforesight.com. Now, Danilo, you. Well. <laughs> My advertisement will be slightly longer, but only slightly. <laughs> See, and this will relate to questions that were raised, starting with Professor Thoman. 
I will just quote the titles of chapters of our report, which will tell you about our approach. There is a chapter saying the following, quantity and quality, strengthening the knowledge-based and data-driven decision-making and cooperation for security and peace building. And it has to do with monitoring of water quality, standards of water quality for different purposes and the need to strengthen international system in that regard. So we will certainly find an interesting platform for further work in that chapter. Second, on various sub-national tensions and conflicts, we have a chapter, People's Diplomacy, Intersectoral Water Management and Decision Making. A lot about the experience in that regard, about possible codes of conduct, voluntary codes, and other soft law approaches that can help in these sort of situations. Three, migration. There will be a discussion on that too, not, not a very comprehensive one, but a discussion which will deal with issues such as employment opportunities to make the migrants capable of paying for water services. That's, that's, that illustrates the type of focus that we would like to explore uh, in the, f the future. Of course, the, pan the report is not the final word. It's, it's a kind of push for further work. And then on financial instruments, I think here uh, we need to talk during coffee break because it's, you know, it's a little too complicated for a one-minute advertisement. But I would like to end on a spiritual note and say many people around the world are not religious. They may be of more materialist orientation. And they should know that human body consists of 60% of water. Therefore, what, 70%? All right, say men 70, women 65 or something, or vice versa. <laughs> there, are, there are differences, I understand. But in any case, the most of body mass is water. So we are water, and therefore we have to deal with water very seriously. That's it. So to thank all of you, this side of the room and that side of the room, I raise a bottle of water. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>